Hello and welcome to episode one of Ask Your Scientists. What is proteomics and why is it important? I'm sitting today with bioinformatics scientist and product marketing manager Margaret Donovan and senior director of discovery, research, and tech development Daniel Hornberg for a conversation on the importance of studying the proteome and some challenges researchers have faced in the past. So Margaret, let's get started with you. Um, why study the proteome? Sure. So I think when it comes to the question, why study the proteome, it's almost like we need to take a step backward and think about, you know, what is, what in general, what, what are we studying when it comes to human biology before getting to sort of the molecular level? And I think that comes to the, one of the most fundamental questions, especially in human genetics, is how does genotype give rise to phenotype? And what I mean by this is the DNA you inherit from your parents, how does that give rise to things like how tall I am, the color of my eyes, am I going to be you know, eventually am I one day going to get sick? And to link these things together, um, one of the amazing things to come out of science recently is our ability to measure, you know, these different molecules in our body. And what these are really telling us is at a mechanistic level, what is going on? And thinking about central dogma, DNA, so gen genotype, mm -hmm. DNA to RNA to protein to phenotype, eye color, disease, likelihood, etc. Um, you know, I think that why study the proteome is we're getting farther down the central dogma. We're getting really close to this phenotype and we're able to actually understand these building blocks, these actually molecular toolkits, um, that are telling us in this exact moment over time, um, you know, this sort of dynamic picture of what's happening within our bodies. Mm -hmm. Daniel, what do you think? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think. Conceptually, with the proteins, as Margaret said, we are so much closer to the to the phenotype, which means instead of looking at what could be, we are looking at what actually is, and 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 that enables us to get a much deeper understanding of biology, of of human health, of the molecular landscape of human health and disease. Proteins are in almost all cases the functional entities. They act as enzymes in the cells. They act as signaling molecules between cells. So they are directly transmitting the information about the phenotype. And that means we can learn, for example, why in a certain disease we we have a high inflammatory state because like these pro-inflammatory cytokines signaling from the tissue that is damaged to the immune cells uh, and back and forth, right, increases uh, the body's response towards that, that, that damage. Something that nucleic acids will have a hard time to, to, to explain. I mean, we can look at transcriptomics, but, but in the end, it is only showing the potential even at that point, right? Uh, a protein can be within the cell and have a function A. It can be then modified and secreted, and then it becomes like essentially a different molecule in terms of its function. And this is something that um, is really unique to proteins, and that is why it's so much more informative to look at the proteome, but also synergistic if we combine it f with the genomics information. Can I ask a question or like, kind of jump off you? Because I love when you say um, it's not what is. Or no, what do you, how do you phrase it? It's not what could be, it's what is. Yeah. And I think that's such a beautiful way to think about proteomics is because there's this dynamic element. There's, it's complex, but it's also dynamic. Absolutely. And, and that also connects to the, to the challenge of the proteomics in general. Yeah, and then so thinking about those challenges, um, you, you touched a little bit, Daniel, on, on transcriptomics, but why hasn't proteomics become as popular as, as, as the other omics? Um, transcriptomics, as you mentioned, uh, epigenomics and genomics. Yeah, and, and that links directly to, to the utility of proteins uh, because, and that may, may sound weird in the first place, but proteins are speaking to such a complex information space. Uh, and that complexity, that information is essentially encapsulated in where is a protein, how much of that protein is. Is that protein interacting with another protein in a protein-protein complex? Mm -hmm. Is that protein post-translationally modified? And all of that not only changes the function of the protein, but also changes its biochemistry. So there are additional challenges then to read out that information, whereas, for example, in genomics, we have a linear stretch of information, essentially four building blocks that we can easily amplify in the, one of the first steps in that process. So that information is fairly simple. And for proteins, we have 20 amino acids. We have 
tons of post-translational modifications. So we think we probably are talking about a million and more different proteoforms, different entities of these molecules, that all or a majority of them have very specific biological functions. Now, to tap into that uh, um, sea of information means we, on the one hand, can learn a lot, but also it means we need to set up the biochemistry and we need to enable the detector to, to really capture that information. And that is one of the reasons, while people have achieved really great insights in proteomics, there's so much more we can discover if we enable people and if we are enabled uh, by technology to look deeper, to look more comprehensively and to quantify the differences across subjects. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree. I think that, like, proteomics is complex. I think you had literally just described why it's so complex, and biochemically it's complex. But I also feel like this introduces a technical challenge mm-hmm. is not even just how do we access these one million proteoforms, it's also thinking about from like a technical perspective what technologies exist that enable that. You're dealing with a biofluid like plasma, where we know that what the top 10 most abundant proteins accounts for like 99% of, that, of the plasma proteome. How do we dig down into those more lowly abundant proteins and, you know, more than likely coming back to this whole idea of genotype phenotype, these are these may be the ones that are actually telling us something about what's going on. So, so if all these challenges that you guys are discussing were solved, uh, what can we expect to learn from studying proteomics? Margaret, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so... Shion, if you invite me back, I promise I won't always uh, talk about genetics, but because this is sort of my favorite thing to talk about, um, you know, if we could solve all challenges, all technical biochemical challenges associated with studying the proteome, something I've always cared about, I mean, this is what I did a lot of my graduate work in, is genotype phenotype. Mm. You know, genome-wide association studies have told us a lot about, you know, risk loci associated with disease. Um, But really what has been missing from those type of studies is what is happening at the molecular level, what mechanisms are driving complex trait and disease, traits and disease. And, you know, there's been a lot of amazing studies that come out of the transcriptomic world that have done like expression QTLs, expression quantitative trait loci studies. Um, And I think if we can push this into proteomics, I know others are doing PQTLs, but being able to do a a protein quantitative trait loci study um, at the proteoform level and really understand the complexity of the proteome, what, and then what, you know, how, how do genetics impact the expression mm-hmm. and the abundance of these proteins? And if we can associate that with disease, that would be like my, that would be my dream. <laughs> Dana, what are your thoughts? Uh, yeah, I can, can only, uh, uh, echo that. I, I think proteins really have a tremendous, uh, potential to to give us biological insights just because they are the functional entities in cells uh, and also a- outside of cells they regulate the activity of our immune system they literally build cells in terms of their structural integrity they they funnel uh, information through different areas and, and different compartments of the cell and uh, they can be activated deactivated by post translation and modifications so all of that is something that is inaccessible if we are talking about nucleic acids. And all of that is of potential utility when we want to understand diseases, when we want to understand trajectories of subjects uh, towards a disease or towards becoming better, if we want to stratify people that are responding to a drug uh, from people that are not responding. Maybe there is a protein, maybe there is a certain pathway that is overactivated that translates to a faster degradation of the drug. And all of that is mediated by proteins, which means understanding the proteome will enable conceptually and categorically different insights uh, than what is possible nowadays with nucleic acid research. Okay, great. Uh, Margaret Daniel, thank you for sitting down with me today uh, for this conversation. To everyone listening, thank you for your interest. Uh, this has been episode one of Ask Your Scientists. What is proteomics and why is it important? Thank you.